Welcome to part four of getting started with coding. In this course, we have already looked at variables, methods, arrays, if statements, and for loops. And in this part, we're going to take a look at classes. We're continuing creating our Minesweeper game. In the last part, we've looked at how to create enough cells for the map that we're trying to create. And in this part, we're going to take a look how we can display the correct values for our cells. If we go to our game map script, in here, we have a map, which is an array, and it's made up of these integers. I want to actually pass these integers to the cell and display that number in the cell. The place where we're going to do that is here in the for each loop that we created last time. And we have the value right there, number. Now, we need to pass that number to our cell. And this is where you can actually see the benefit of using a class. So both scripts, the game map and cell, they are actually classes. So right there, we have class and game map. We only use one instance of game map in our game, but the cell class is used for every cell that we instantiate. And what that allows us is to store the state and specific values for that cell in that class. So in this cell class, let me clean up some of the variables that we have been using to explain how variables work. And what we left off here is with this variable game object image, which is public. And this game object image is what we use to set active to false on click. And that shows the number that is behind the image. Now for this class cell, there's some other variables that I want to create so that each cell would actually have access to its own text. So let's actually create another variable public text. And also let's create int. I'll call it number and I want to set this number from the game map whenever we instantiate the cell so that the value that we have for that cell would be passed into the cell class and we can later on use that number to determine what we want to do when that cell is clicked. Since the number is private in this class that won't allow us to set or get the value of this variable inside of our game map. So what we'll do is actually create a public method and we'll call it set number. Now for this method, we actually want to pass in a variable input number so we can set it to this number. So let's say int number and add curly brackets. Inside here, we want to set this number of our class to the number that we've passed in. But we have a problem here. We use the same variable name for both of them. And what's going to happen in this situation is whenever we actually look for a number, it will use this number. You can see that it highlighted this variable. That means this value is going to be used. Now to access the number of the class, what we can do is actually add a keyword this. So this dot number, you can see that now it highlights the class variable number. And by using this, we can make sure that we have control over which variable we're using. So with this dot number, we're using the variable of our class and we can set it to equal to number. One more thing that we want to do when we set the number is write that number to our text field. So since we're expecting the text value to be connected, we can write text dot text and pass in the value that we want to write there. So if we try to pass in number, we get an error. And it's because the text is actually expecting a string and number is an integer. What we can do is convert it to a string. The integer actually has a method called toString. We can access that and that will convert the integer number to a string. So what kind of power does our class give us? You can see that we can save a specific value for that instance. And in here, it will actually use that value to change how the cell looks. Now we could have changed how the cell looks like from the game app inside of our for loop access the text element there. But by separating the logic in classes, we break down our code to be more independent of each other. That means that our cell class actually controls everything that is cell related. And our game map is controlling the bigger picture, the collection of all cells. So back into our game app, we need to pass the number to our cell class. To do that, we need to get that cell component or access to that cell class. The way that we do that in Unity is after we instantiate this game object, 
the instantiate method actually returns a game object. So we can create a variable of type game object and let's call the variable cell GB. And this will give us a game object that was created into our game. And now in here, we can use the cell GB to get a component. And our cell class, because we extended the mono behavior, is also considered a component in Unity. And we'll be able to use this get component option to get cell. So in here, we can see that there's some new syntax, and it's the greater and less than sign. And inside there, we can specify what type of a component we want to get. And a type is basically what class are we looking for. So we're actually looking for the cell class that is connected on our game object. And this method should return a cell type object that exists on this game object. So we can create a cell variable, let's call it cell. And now from here, we can access the cell variable, and we can find the set number method that we have created. For the set number, we need to pass in number and we have the number right there in our for each loop. So now we can save this script and go back to unity. In here, we want to go to our cell prefab. And now on our cell script, we have a new option here, text. So let's actually connect the text object here, go back to our scene, click play. And now if we click on these values, you can see that we're displaying the numbers that we had in the map. Now if we go to our canvas and select one of the cells, we can't see the number here. But if you want to see the number, we can go to the inspector options right there and switch to debug mode. And that will actually expose the private variables as well. And right there under cell, we can see that we have a number variable and it's set to one. So if we select the next one, that one is nine. So the value that we have saved is available here. And we can use that number to determine what's going to happen when we click. Now in Minesweeper, there's three variations of what's going to happen once you click on the cell. And it is if you click on a bomb, which is number nine in our case, then you lose the game. If you click on a zero, which is an empty cell, what's it going to do is look at the neighboring cells and expose the values for those. And if you click on any other number, it's just going to show the number for that cell. So let's go and see how we can actually make that happen. Right here in the cell on click, after we hide the image, what we want to do is check for the value of our number. So if our number equals nine, let's add a debug.log and say game lost. Then we can chain another if statement by using else if and check for number equals zero. So if a number equals zero, then we want to show neighboring. Let's do a debug log and say show neighboring cell. And for any other condition, we can do an else without an if statement. And in here, we're going to say in debug dot log, and let's say cell cleared. So that's the three variations that we have here. One more thing that I want to change here in the cell is to not display zero when it's zero. And instead of displaying a number nine to display an asterisk for our bomb. So we can actually use the same options that we used here for our number and paste that inside here. Our number to string is going to be our default values. And then for zero, we're going to say text dot text equals and pass in an empty string. So we won't display anything. For our nine, we can say text dot text and pass in an asterisk for our bomb. Now currently, I just have debug messages for our different states. And for our game to work properly, we need to actually have like a game manager or some other approach to create a place where we would actually manage the game lost and counting how much cells we cleared if we have successfully cleared the whole map or not. And also add some logic that will show the neighboring cells that we will do in the next video. But in this video, another thing that I want to look at is multidimensional arrays. So currently we have an integer array. It's one dimensional. So it's just a list of numbers. But for a map, we actually want to create a 2D map. And for that, we can actually use a multidimensional array. The way you create a multidimensional array is by adding a comma here. So if we add one comma, this is going to be a 2D array. If we add another comma, that's going to create a 3D array. And then we can do 4D and so on. But we're only looking for a 2D array here. So we're just going to have one comma. And when we convert this map to a 2D array, you can see that there's some errors here. 
So we need to actually pass in a 2D array here. And we can do that by adding another curly brackets around the values that we have already. And now we can start making our 2D map. So let's add a comma after our first row, then paste the next value in here. And let's make a 4 by 4 map. So let's say we have a mine right there. So all around here, we'll see ones. And let's say that we have another mine right here. So this is going to be a one, this is going to be a two, this is going to be a one, this is going to be one, and the other values are going to be switching to zeros. So this is going to be our test map right there, a two dimensional map. Now, if we save this file and go back to Unity, run the game, all of the cells are actually going to get created. So the for each loop still works on a two dimensional array, but you can see that it's actually just a line because our grid layout group actually is just going to fill up the whole row until it reaches the edges before it's going to go to the next line. And we can actually change some of the settings here. So in here we have constraints. Currently it's set to flexible and we can switch it to fixed column count. So when we do that, you can see that the value that we pass in here is going to determine how much cells we're going to have in one row. And we want to have a constraint of four. So that creates a four by four. Let's take a look at the values. And right there, you can see that the values are displayed correctly. Our map is showing what we have passed in as the values for our multidimensional array. Now switching that constraint manually is not an option for us because we might have different size maps. So let's make that switch using code. Under constraints, let's make sure we switch to fixed column count. The default value for constraint count, let's set it to 10 and let's switch that value inside the game map based on the dimensions that we have for our map. So let's go to our game map script. And in here, let's add another public variable. This is going to be our grid layout group. But to use that, we actually need to add another library here using unity engine.ui because grid layout group is a UI component. So let's create that and we'll call it a grid layout. Now right here in the start, before we start running for each, let's configure our constraint count. So let's get the grid layout variable and set constraint count to be four, but we don't want to keep it at four. We actually want to look at the size of the map. So in here we can say map dot, and then we have the length, but the length is going to be 16. We actually want to use get length method. And for the get length method, we can actually pass in a variable for dimension. We're going to pass in one zero is going to be the amount of rows and one is going to be the amount of columns that we have. Now that we configured the constraint count by using our map, we can save the file and go back to Unity. Then we need to connect the grid layout here. So we can actually drag and drop it right there. That's going to create a connection. Currently, the constraint is set at 10. And if we run the game, the constraint gets switched to four. Let's actually turn off the debug, switch it to normal so that all the private variables are going to disappear. And right there, we can see that our game is working just like we expected. Our debug log message is shown right there. And if the values are not changing is because it's actually grouping the values together. You can see that we have cleared nine cells. Five of the cells were actually uh, empty and two of them were actually a mine. So we're going to stop here for this video. And in the next video, we're going to take a look at how we can actually control the game if we have lost also count the how many cells we have cleared and win the game in that case. I hope you enjoyed this course. Click on the like button if you do and I'll see you in the next one.